Hello everyone. Welcome to the Return to Functioning in Children and Teens with Chronic Pain, the Role of Parents webinar. We're glad you're here with us today. My name is Tanya Hyde and I'll be moderating the webinar today. I'm the project manager with the Canadian Institute for the Relief of Pain and Disability and this webinar is co-sponsored by ourselves, CRRPD, uh, and Pain BC in collaboration with the Canadian Pain Coalition. It's also made possible through the support of the Direct Access Program through the BC government. As I mentioned, my name is Tanya and I'm moderating the webinar today and handling the Q&A session. And our presenters today are Dr. Sue Bennett and Dr. Aaron Moon. Dr. Bennett has worked as a team psychologist with the Complex Pain Service at BC Children's Hospital since 1991. She's a clinical investigator with the Child and Family Research Institute and an adjunct professor in psychology with UBC. She has published extensively in the field of pediatric chronic pain and its impact on children and family. Dr. Erin Moon has been on staff at BC Children's Hospital since 2012. Uh, she completed a postdoctoral fellowship focusing on research and clinical training in the assessment and management of pediatric pain. Dr. Moon has published a number of peer-reviewed articles and book chapters in the field of pediatric pain. And I will go ahead and hand it over to you, Erin and Sue. Thanks. Thanks very much, Tanya. And um, thanks to all of the people uh, logged into the webinar for being here today. So before we start, we just wanted to mention that uh, the majority of our talk will be focused towards uh, parents and caregivers of children's and children and teens with chronic pain. But we also think um, that the discussion will be really very relevant for clinicians who are working with um, this population as well. And um, just to remind you, as Tanya mentioned, we'll be responding to questions at the end of the presentation today. Okay, so in terms of objectives for today's webinar, what we'll do is introduce the ways in which chronic pain can impact the day-to-day -day lives of children and teenagers. We'll also provide some guidelines for parents to help their child or teen live a healthy life despite chronic pain. And these will be drawn both from our clinical experience as well as from the research literature on chronic pain in children and teens. And we'll also provide some key resources for parents and caregivers for further reading. So before we move on to speak about how chronic pain impacts the functioning of children and teens, uh, we'll just note that we're assuming that most of those in the audience are familiar with the definition of chronic pain. But really, we're referring to uh, pain that has persisted typically past three months. Um, and these children or teens may have a specific medical diagnosis uh, linked with their pain, or the chronic pain may be a diagnosis or a disorder in and of itself. So really, our discussion applies to both of these groups equally. Okay, so let's talk about functioning. This is a word that gets thrown a lot uh, around a lot in the research, um, but what does it really mean? So in terms of the, the dictionary definition of functioning, it's the action for which a person or thing is specifically fitted or used or for which a thing exists. So when we're thinking about functioning for children and teens, what do we really mean? Well, children and teens are specifically fitted for things like growing, learning, playing, socializing, gaining independence, and having fun. So really what we're talking about today is how chronic pain impacts on all of these aspects of a child or a teen's life. So functioning really includes all areas of the child or teen's life. This would include uh, physical aspects of life, so things like nutrition, um, the child's sleep, and also relationships with family and friends. Uh, that's obviously a very um, big, important um, task of, of childhood and, and the teenage years is learning how to navigate relationships with people your own age and adults. And it would also uh, include school. We really talk about school oftentimes as the job of a child or a teen. So certainly we're interested in how chronic pain impacts school. And also, importantly, fun activities and hobbies that the child or the teen 
um, has as part of their life. So when we think about chronic pain's impact on functioning, we oftentimes refer to this analogy that sometimes what can happen is a little bit of a whirlpool can develop. So a cycle can oftentimes develop where um, as pain lasts longer and longer, the child or the teen's functioning uh, goes down. So many areas of their life are impacted. And then when that happens, usually what we see is that the pain becomes worse. Um, because a child or the teen is not able to get out of the house, do the things that they enjoy, things that lift their mood, and also things that help manage their pain in terms of physical activity. Um, and so a vicious cycle can really develop um, where chronic pain and functioning are sort of swirling around and it can start to feel a little bit out of control for the teen and for their family as well. So let's break it down into specific areas of functioning. We know that children and teens with chronic pain uh, from the research miss school more often, oftentimes have concentration and memory problems, and oftentimes get behind in their schoolwork. And in fact, we recently looked at some questionnaires that we collect from the children and teens who we see here at the BC Children's Hospital Complex Pain Clinic. And about 45% had missed more than two weeks of school in the past three months. So that just gives you an idea of the amount um, that these kids and teenagers are missing out in terms of academics. And also in terms of the social aspects of being in school and fitting in with their, with their friends. We know that children and teens with chronic pain also uh, may be seeing their friends less and participating less in things like extracurricular activities. And we know as well that another area of impact is that these kids and teens may need to rely more on their parents. So one of their main jobs is to be working on developing responsibility and independence from parents. But with chronic pain in the mix, that can be really complicated. So the child or the teen may need to rely more on their parents, even for basic things like mobility, getting around, um, things like getting to and from and attending doctor's appointments, things like that. So, it can, really, um, it can really interfere with that process. And we also know that children and teens with chronic pain get less sleep and, and the quality of sleep that they get is poor. And they also tell us in the research that they have less energy. And again, we see this oftentimes in our complex pain clinic. So the same set of questionnaires that I mentioned, we found that about 77% of the teens that we see um, and kids as well reported that their uh, sleep was disturbed by pain. So this is certainly a big issue. Thinking a little bit more about school, we oftentimes talk about this cycle where um, pain can lead to school being missed, the child or the teen gets further behind, that leads to stress and worry, and that oftentimes makes the pain worse. And so that makes it harder to get back to school. So around and around, sometimes this cycle can go. So the relationship between pain and functioning is not a direct one. So we all know that pain is very complex and no two people are affected in exactly the same way. So if you think of two children who might have a similar pain condition and who might both be rating their pain as say a 6 out of 10 in terms of how bad it is, we might see that one child is out of school, not seeing friends, feeling very sad. The other child might be at school most days, uh, participating at, in activities with friends, and only feeling sad or worried once in a while. So how can we make sense of this? It's really clear that pain and functioning, there's no direct one-to-one -one relationship. It's not a straight line, and there's a number of other factors that come into play. So we know that it's very important um, to look at how the child or the teen is able to cope with their pain, how they're doing in terms of their mental health and wellness. So how's their mood? Uh, what's their worry level like? And also a number of family factors. So how much stress is there in the family? What are the other challenges that the parents and the family is facing? All of these things certainly impact um, a child or a teen's functioning when they have chronic pain.
We know that it's very important also to acknowledge that chronic pain has a very big impact on parents. So the research shows us that parents of children and teens with chronic pain um, are oftentimes suffering from a lot of emotional stress, financial difficulties, and also trouble in their relationships. And a real sense of burden can occur. And from working with many parents here at Children's Hospital, they oftentimes talk about this real juggling act that they're trying to manage, sort of up on a high wire, managing their own needs, um, the needs of other family members, and, um, and the chronic pain condition. So unfortunately, we see that sometimes clinically significant levels of stress, anxiety, and depression can be experienced by some parents of children and teens with chronic pain. So what we'd like to do now is move into a bit more of an interactive portion of the webinar. And before we go into more detailed guidelines, what we'd like to do is to do an activity to get you thinking about how parents can best support children and teens with chronic pain. And really, this activity will be drawn from a variety of sources of expertise, both the parents and families we've met, our own clinical experience, and the research. So we hope you have fun with, with this, because we have a fun quiz for you. And don't worry, uh, we will not be assigning any marks. Um, they're going to be a series of eight suggestions for parents that will come up on the screen. And for each one, You'll get a chance to indicate if you think, no, that's not a helpful thing for parents to do, um, or it depends, or yes, that is a helpful thing for parents who have a child or teen with chronic pain to do. So you'll get an opportunity, if you so wish, to click on the answer using the mouse, and we'll take a tally of the responses at the end of the eight items so that we'll get a summary of your opinions. And don't worry, just go with your first impulse in answering and have some fun with it. And so Tanya is going to help us to go through each of those items one by one. All right. First up, we have giving your child slash teen reassurance about pain. Is reminding your child slash teen to use their pain coping skills or tools. Excusing your child or teen from chores or other responsibilities. Quitting your job to stay home with your child or teen. Listening to your child or teen and understanding their pain is real. Frequently checking in with your child or teen about their pain. Discouraging your child or teen from doing activities because of pain. Distracting your child or teen with fun activities. Now, Susan, would you like me to go through the answers? Um, well, sure. I just wanted to say first that when, when we're uh, doing this sort of live and interacting, it's, it's always interesting in terms of uh, people's comments. And I know in the webinar format, it's a little bit different. Um, but if people do, as we go through the questions, have um, and after, we will be discussing each of these in a little bit more depth in terms of um, making some suggestions from, from our perspective and from the evidence as well. But if, as we go through, um, any of the participants feel like there was something about one of those specific questions that they really wanted to make a comment about, um, please feel free to include that in the Q&A um, session um, at, at the end, and we'd love to hear from you. Often the it depends. There's a really a rich and fertile uh, kind of a set of information that comes out of that as well. Very good. All right. Uh, going back to the first question, um, the results, 55% said yes, helpful for giving your child or teen reassurance about pain. And then there was the next level was 35% for it depends, and then 10% for no, not helpful. And then on to the next one. Reminding your child or teen to use their pain coping tools, skill, tools or skills, uh, yes, helpful got 80%. And it depends got 20%. And to the next, excusing your child or teen from chores or other responsibilities. 60% said it depends. 
35% no not helpful and 5% yes helpful. Quitting your job to stay home with your child or teen, uh, majority was no not helpful at 71% and it depends at 29%. Um, listening to your child or teen and understanding their pain is real, 100%. Yes, that's helpful. Uh, frequently checking in with your child or teen about their pain. Um, it's pretty even across the board, a little bit stronger on the it depends with 38%. But yes, helpful was 33 and no, not helpful was 29 And then discouraging your child or teen from doing activities because of pain, 79% no, not helpful, and 21% for it depends. And then finally, distracting your child or teen with fun activities got a very strong yes with 82%, and it depends for just 18%. Terrific. Yeah, so um, as we commonly find when we do this interactively uh, with people, there are a lot of it depends. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? The one 100% agreement is the listening and validating that the pain is real. And absolutely, I think that's the bottom line place that everyone needs to start from, be that young person, um, parent, teacher, uh, professional, healthcare professional, everyone. So um, we hear you loud and clear on that and are in full agreement. Um, and so some of the other items I think you'll find as we uh, go through some of both our clinical experience and the research findings, um, uh, we, we may touch on uh, some of why there are some it depends factors in, in, in them all. Um, and so I'm going to turn the mic back to Erin for the next uh, step in terms of starting to present some suggestions and guidelines. Okay, so I'm just going to skip ahead here in the presentation to our next portion. Okay, so now we'd like to move into some guidelines for parents on how to help your child or teen return to functioning. And um, it was really neat for us to see the quiz results um, because a lot of these guidelines will speak to um, some of those questions. And just as we saw with the quiz results, there really is no one size fits all. Um, it was interesting that we did get 100% on the listening and validating that pain is real. So that one, we, we're all certainly in agreement there. Um, but we do hope that these guidelines will um, give you some food for thought and that some of them will apply for your family. And these are really the ones that we thought were key given our clinical work and the research. So first of all, it's really important to help your child or teen understand why they have pain. And oftentimes this isn't straightforward. So it's important to check your child or teen's understanding of their pain and to bring them to see clinicians who can help explain what's going on. Because especially if you're in the circumstance where there's no um, clear-cut diagnosis that uh, your doctors can provide you, um, your child or teen is really going to need some help from you to understand what's going on and um, understand that chronic pain can sometimes be a disorder in and of itself. So letting your child or teen know, um, as we all agree, um, that you understand that their pain is real is really a starting point for our guidelines and um, it was neat to see that that was a resounding yes, always helpful in the poll. And so uh, learning about the mind-body connection um, we think is a really important part of this. So I'll talk a little bit more about that now. So if we think back to um, Descartes in the 1600s, um, the philosophy called Cartesian dualism is really where it was at. So the mind and the body, um, Descartes described, were completely separate. So the first schematic there that you can see of the person with their toe um, being burned in the fire, really what that's depicting is um, a mechanism whereby the fire displaces the skin and it 
a tiny thread is pulled and then a chamber in the skull automatically opens um, and that leads the foot to contract. So everything is completely automatic and the body reaction is completely separate from the conscious mind. So really the main idea is that the body and the mind are completely distinct. Really when we're looking at the current understanding of chronic pain, um, it's along the lines of the second schematic there. So the mind and the body are always connected and there's always a relationship back and forth. So when we look at chronic pain, the mental and the physical are always important to understand. Um, and it's really important for both you and for your child or teen to acknowledge this really powerful connection. So this is pretty much where I always start um, in my work with uh, children and teens with chronic pain, helping them understand that you need your brain to feel pain and without your brain um, there is no pain. So, you know, there's sometimes that idea that the pain is in your head. Well, that's actually correct. <laughs> um, um, but what that means is that what's going on in the brain is, is very important in terms of the pain experience. So it's important to look at things like worry, look at mood, look at thoughts about pain in order to find some clues about how we can better manage it. Okay, so the next guideline is for parents to take a rehabilitation approach to pain. So unfortunately, there might not be a quick fix or a magic bullet to help your child or teen um, with their pain, but it is very important to help them stay hopeful about recovery, even if, if a quick fix isn't possible. And really, even during the stage when you might be having a number of medical exams or tests or investigations, helping your child or teen focus on returning to as much of a normal life as they can is really critical. Um, sort of continuing the process of many, many medical appointments and tests um, can lead to some stress and feelings of helplessness. And so it's important to boost up feelings of hope and trying to get back to as much normal functioning as possible. We always advise uh, parents to focus on helping their child or their teen increase functioning rather than decreasing pain. We find this to be most helpful. So we know from a great number of studies that when adults and children pay more attention to their own pain and get more attention from others focused on their pain, they tend to rate their pain as higher. So what this tells us is that switching the focus to getting back to a normal life and getting back to functioning um, is really important. And this speaks to that quiz item about distraction. So we know that when children are distracted by things like fun activities or even their schoolwork, um, their pain ratings tend to be lower. That being said, um, as you know, it is always important to acknowledge the child or the teen's pain, but to try to avoid the trap of frequently asking and checking in about it because really this can lead to a scenario where it feels like the pain can be taking over the entire family. One thing that we do sometimes recommend is that families can set aside a weekly pain review or pain chat. And so, you know, you can set a timer um, and spend a particular amount of time checking in and really delving into what's going on with the child or the teen's pain. And so whether this needs to happen weekly or maybe once a day. It's just a way to help contain the discussion sometimes. And I'll just pass over to Dr. Bennett to talk a little bit more about school. So for adults with chronic pain, I think it's, it's kind of widely and increasingly known in, uh, by society as a whole. There are, there are huge costs for chronic pain. And the costs are personal and they're economic. And the biggest impact for adults on functioning is having to take time off work. For children and teens, as we've said, school is their job. And as Erin mentioned, there is a very clear link between chronic pain and missed school. Some of the young people that we see at Children's have actually completely stopped attending school, and this can be a big problem that can actually snowball into an even bigger health problem than the pain itself. And so it's not just a matter of falling behind academically, but also kids fall out of the loop of friendships and fun, and mood is affected. And we do see some situations where the kids seem to end up almost cornered into their homes. And that was not who they were before the onset of pain. So just thinking back to that whirlwind 
cool picture. That's sort of part of what we sometimes see. And in circumstances like that, we are often talking with the young people and saying, you know, you do need to get back to school despite pain. And this is when we get that look like, really? Are, are you crazy? How am I possibly going to do that? So obviously, return to school and any um, sort of change in activity or functioning needs to be done in steps. And to make those steps realistic and attainable, we need to start with something, we need to set up for success. So if we're talking about return to school, we'll often talk with teens and families about picking their favorite class or their easiest class or maybe even just going for lunchtime if they're thinking about returning to school. And so really it's based on what their tolerance is and their starting point is unique to them and then stepping up or building upon that from there. So, as you know, and this is why you've tuned in, parents play a really key role in, in helping young people. And in return to schooling, in particular, parents can play a very key role. So it's very important that there be a good working relationship and good communication established between school personnel um, and the family. Um, and so often this needs to include not just the teachers, but also the counselor and the principal. Um, and they all need to know how to help their students with chronic pain. I think that's one of the most encouraging things from my perspective we've seen is that schools are really starting to get it, although often there still is some need for helping them to understand better. An agreed upon plan for the type and also the amount of schooling is what's needed. And this may start off with perhaps a mix of online schooling and some school attendance and then may shift. Or for some kids and teens, we find that actually it ends up that homeschooling or full-time online is actually the best option for them, perhaps even for learning reasons, not just for pain reasons. So it's a matter not just of looking at get yourself back to school. It's about learning, and that's why we call it schooling, return to schooling. So over time, we found and worked with schools on, on a number of what they call adaptations or accommodations that can be very helpful for children and teens with chronic pain. So factors or considerations such as in the older grades being able to have a spare block, um, being able to have a place to go to rest midday or to use coping strategies, having extra time on exams to allow for concentration, um, and, and uh, decreased distraction. Uh, sometimes also writing in a separate room for exams is helpful. And something called thinning of assignments may be necessary in some but not all cases. And that's where if there ends up being a lot of missed school in bouts of time periods, then it's a matter of teachers working with the student to thin the assignments to the most essential. But once you find what works, the school-based team can put together what's called an IEP, or an individualized individual education plan. And then that can follow the student from year to year, if needed, and if still relevant, and can be reviewed each fall. This one's my favorite because, um, you know, I have to admit, and I'm sure we'll all admit, that even as adults, we find pacing a very hard thing to do. And yet pacing, when you're a child or a teen, is an essential part of the return to function and getting around and over your pain. So let's face it, none of us like to do it, and it's actually cruel and unusual punishment to expect a kid or teen to have to do it. They're used to being able to overdo things and then to be able to bounce back the next day with no problem. But that just isn't the case when you have chronic pain. So we've been talking a bit about maintaining expectations for your child or teen. And I thought it was interesting in our survey, that was one of the things that, that you were sort of most split on was expectations in particular areas. So for example, um, you know, chores or, or that kind of thing. And I imagine there's a lot of yes, it depends um, comments in, in, in that particular example. 
But we do know that maintaining normal expectations is a key, key aspect um, for making sure that chronic pain doesn't take over. Because chronic pain can be sneaky. And if you don't realize, bit by bit, it erodes your normal child or teen life, and it can even change the whole family's way of interacting. And so normal expectations seem to sometimes fly out the window without even realizing it. We recently had a young adult who's a graduate from our pain program send us an article that he wrote on what he called chronic pain Stockholm syndrome. And it's absolutely profound and fascinating. And it, um, at the end of the webinar, we will be giving you uh, the uh, uh, web link, our website for People in Pain Network. And this young man is uh, now actually a group facilitator for teen support groups. And so what he talks about is that he warns against falling under the spell of your captor. And in this case, chronic pain is the captor. Rather than fighting against it, you find yourself incorporating it into your life and into your identity of who you are. And you can almost forget that it's actually the thing that's holding you captive and that it's your enemy and not your friend. And I certainly can't... Um, explain it as well as Ryan does. So I do encourage you to look that up and to be mindful about how pain can sneak into a young person's identity and to guard against that. So we keep coming back to setting firm expectations for your child or teen as you would have if they had not had the pain. And we do certainly hear and appreciate that it's very hard for parents sometimes to do this. And in fact, even encouraging a young person in pain to go back to school, parents will tell us it's like you have to put ice in your veins um, and know that it's the right thing to do. And you're not going to be popular probably in some circumstances. The form and type of support that a particular child or teen needs varies, and also it varies based on age and developmental stage, and also from situation to situation. So it's really crucial that as parents you sit down together with your young person and have a real straight up conversation. Here's the things we as, a parent, as parents must do and will do. Here's what we can do. Here's what we can't do. Um, and also we've had parents just really saying it's important uh, to draw some lines as well. So there might be a certain timing of support that you're not able to give. So I can't listen and validate at 11.30 or 12 or 1 as well as I can earlier in the day. So just making that clear up front and communicating that with the young person can be really important. We've been running a treatment group for teens at VC Children's that we call Pain 101. And one of the most helpful sessions that we had in our first group that we ever ran, the teens asked if they could brainstorm and come up with what they called a dear parents letter. They shared it with their parents in the next group session. And so that type of thing could definitely be done by you individually. There always does come a point, and typically it's in teen years, although sometimes it's even earlier, when parents really do need very intentionally to start weaning off their support and protectiveness and letting their child set their own goals and make their own mistakes. And I have to say that that's one normal developmental milestone that can sometimes get off track for parents and teens with chronic pain. Without realizing it, we can sometimes see parents and, and teens sort of joined at the hip or talking as if they are like friends um, and just things that are out of whack from where they normally would be. I have to say that probably hearing the word coping is a thing that people hate the most, and understandably so. I mean, nobody, first of all, wants to have chronic pain, and then when they realize they do have chronic pain, no one wants to be told they have to cope with it. Who wouldn't prefer that it just went away? However, as we all realistically know, coping and having strategies and tools in your toolkit are really paramount to being able to function well 
and to be healthy and well despite chronic pain. And so we've, we've been, um, uh, over time, using more and more the words toolkit. And uh, we're just delighted to know that recently on the People in Pain Network website, uh, there is a toolkit now not only for adults uh, but for youth with a whole range of tried and true um, ideas and strategies. And so you, without realizing it, probably you and your youth already do have some coping strategies or tools in your toolkit. But it's a matter of making them more clear and more specific and agreeing upon them and knowing what it is that the young person wants to do. What they might choose might be very different than what you as a parent or adult choose as a way of man managing pain or even just life stress in general. It can be simple. It can be from like heating up a, a heat pack or distraction or it can be more complicated. It can be about goal setting or pacing activities or one of the key things that I, I, we won't have a whole lot of time to talk about today but is really important and that is what's called sleep hygiene. So strategies that help a person get a good night's sleep and that decrease waking up and that just make the bedroom a place that's all about sleep and not other activities. And so that would be included as a toolkit strategy. And as well, we um, tend to work with young people on some mind and body strategies like muscle relaxation or meditation or imagery or self-hypnosis. Um, I have to say that deep breathing, as helpful as it is, is often also something that the kids and teens are saying, please just don't tell me just to breathe because that doesn't work. But surprisingly, as one of the tools in the toolkit, it really can be helpful and is important. And as we were just reviewing um, the webinar before presenting it to you today, I had a little laugh to myself because I realized that we actually left self-support for parents to the end and we maybe should even have put it first. And isn't that interesting because so often we hear from the parents that we work with, I just don't have time for myself. It's all about my kids right now. Um, and so making yourself number one and making sure you have a support network and people that are there for you is really crucial. And in fact, just going back to that Dear Parents letter that he told you about, number one on their list was please, we, we encourage parents, please take care of your own health and happiness and let us know what you're doing that's working for you because they express a lot of guilt about being a burden to parents and possibly even causing family or marital problems. And so knowing that you have your own support team, that you're human, you have your own challenges, and that you are dealing with them is a really important piece of the whole puzzle for helping a young person with chronic pain. There's no doubt about it, parenting can be tough at the best of times, but with something as challenging as chronic pain, which has no timeline for resolution and no one clear treatment or cure, it definitely can get overwhelming at times. And we have been very humbled by the sharing that parents have, have had with us and with each other um, talking about just how stressful this is. So please be kind to yourselves and listen to your own body's warnings. If you need to seek some professional help for your own mood or in some cases for your own pain and for your own coping, it's not a bad thing. Just remember that being imperfect and seeking help can actually be a great example to set for your young person. And so I just want to switch back to Erin, who's going to share with you some of the resources um, that, um, that we um, share with parents. And don't worry if you can't write them all down or hear them all now, because as Tanya let you know, this um, webinar will be archived both on the CR CIRPD network, or, um, web, and also on the Pain BC site. Hi again. So in terms of resources for parents that we would recommend, um, certainly 
these are the top of our list. So Pain BC is a great resource for families who are coping with chronic pain. And the people in Pain Network, um, Dr. Bennett did refer to that a couple of times. One of the things that you can find there is a toolkit, both for adults and for young people with chronic pain, as well as a link to find um, the uh, young person, sort of the um, alumni of, of BC Children's Hospital Pain Service, talking a little bit about his analogy of the chronic pain Stockholm Syndrome. So we both really would encourage you to check that out. Um, Kelty Mental Health is another great resource for families and um, really is a wealth of information about um, how to find support for things like stress, worry, low mood. There's also um, a number of links for things like relaxation strategies that you might want to add to the toolkit, um, some mindfulness scripts that you can download. Um, so it really um, does provide a lot of really rich information for families. And About Kids Health is another website that we oftentimes recommend. This can be really helpful just for finding some basic health information. Maybe you're needing some ideas as a family for how your teen could explain their condition to other um, people their age, that type of thing. So that website can really help with things like that. We also wanted to point out a DVD that was created here by the Complex Pain team at BC Children's Hospital called Complex Pain, What to Do When Pain Won't Go Away that includes, um, that features um, a number of teens with chronic pain and they talk about their journey and um, what was most helpful for them in getting back to functioning. There are a couple of books as well that we really would encourage you to check out. One by um, Dr. Lonnie Zeltzer, um, and um, one by Dr. Leora Kuttner as well. Um, and these books as well as the DVD that I mentioned are available at the bookstore here at BC Children's. And so you can find out more on the website there. There's also a family resource library where you can take out uh, resources such as these books and DVDs. And the library will actually ship them to you free of charge and you can ship them back in an envelope. Um, so that's a really good resource to know about. You can check their catalog online and, um, and um, certainly access um, some of these resources. Okay, so with that, we'd like to move on to the question and answer um, period of the webinar. Very good. Thank you very much for the presentation. That was great. Um, right now, we don't have any questions as of yet, so I would encourage attendees, if you have anything you would like to ask of um, Dr. Bennett or Dr. Moon, um, to go ahead and type your questions into the questions box now, and I will ask them for you. I did, in the meantime, I did have a question. Um, I was curious around if you find that there are challenges around um, getting parents, I guess, involved or interested in doing more of the mental health side of, of the treatments versus like pain medications and those types of things. And if there's um, any tips you have around working with parents and children around that, if there's resistance to that? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So, um, yes, certainly um, there can be some resistance because oftentimes people are at the phase where they want to continue, you know, turning over every stone to see if there might be, um, you know, either a diagnosis or a medication or a medical intervention that may help. Um, and it is a really difficult transition um, for many families to move into more of a rehabilitation approach and also approach that um, includes mind and body strategies. Really what I find um, most helpful in my work is to include both parents and children in education around that connection between the mind and the body, letting them know about the science behind that, things like the gate control model of pain. Um, and really letting them know that the research shows us that regardless of the cause of pain, there are some ways that we can help using mind-body strategies. Um, and really in the complex pain service, um, 
what's oftentimes discussed is sort of a 3P approach. So uh, psychology, um, the physician, and physiotherapy. So it really is a wraparound approach that is what's going to be most helpful in the end. All right. I'll just add to that, I think um, we, we tend, uh, the young people that we see in the hospital setting have sometimes felt like people think that it's all in their head or that they're crazy or nutty. And so we really address that head on right, right from the start. Well, there isn't a psychologist on the team or in the program because we think you're nutty. And so, you know, I think as Dr. Moon has said, we explain the role of the mind-body and the body-mind. And so that's why as well we have a physiotherapist um, as well as a physician and a nurse clinician and psychologist um, on the team. So covering all aspects for managing the pain. Very good. And then we had a, have a question about how to balance awareness of pain during activities to prevent doing too much and having a flare-up? That's a really good one. Um, and I, I think that that's where both the physio and the psychologist sort of have different perspectives um, or, or, or complementary perspectives. And so um, it, it it's, it's one of those it depends um, categories um, because depending on whether the young person sort of is in the phase where they really need to see the consequences of overdoing it, it might be that they need to have a bit of leeway to overdo it and then see that, you know, that rest of that day or week is, is wrecked as a result of it. I mean, I think it takes several kicks at the can to, to get to the point where a young person can say, oh, okay, I get it. I, I do have to listen to my body sooner and stop sooner. And what seems to prevent that is having a proactive plan. So when we talk about pacing, it's about finding what your tolerance is currently. What can you currently do without sending your pain through the roof and then doing only that at first and then just very gradually bumping it up. Um, of course, as I say, recognizing that, you know, in the life of a young person or a teen, there's going to be times they're going to want to just, you know, blow it out the window and go to the mall or, you know, go to the uh, concert or, and, and know that they'll suffer the consequences. But uh, and the, quest, the wording of the question was, I, I think, also about attention to pain. Um, and, and you're absolutely right, the person asking it, that there is such a balance between knowing when do I tune into pain and when do I distract. And sometimes, although we seem like we're a bit paradoxical in our advice, although we're saying that distraction is the key thing that works, um, it is also a matter of having to check in with your body sometimes and listen to what it's saying before it's shouting at you. Does that answer the question this person posed? I will let you know if they respond. Um, in the meantime, there is another question. Um, a woman, oh sorry, there is someone the person that asked that question said, I like this as I don't want to nag them to pay too much focus on the pain, and the depends is one of those times. So yeah, I think that was helpful in answering the question. And then um, another question, or it might be a comment. Let me see. My daughter found MBSR starting, started at BCCH, actually, uh, very useful, plus regular physio, and working with a psychologist, but her daughter still wonders if there are any medications that are useful for chronic myofascial pain, which is her main struggle now is getting comfortable sleep. Well, it's it's lovely to hear, and and you're talking about mindfulness-based uh, approaches, and we have two specialists that run some groups here, and, and Dr. Moon mentioned about the Kelty Mental Health website, um, and so certainly mindfulness is one of the strategies that that, can, that is mentioned there. Obviously, as a psychologist, and both of us are psychologists, um, we are not really the ones equipped to be addressing the questions of medication, and certainly not related to a specific syndrome. Um, but what I can say is that the physician who is the case manager for this young, or any young person, um, would, would be presumably taking a look at the balance of uh, medication, whether it's needed for help with sleep, 
um, or whether it's needed for help with pain to be able to sort of help do um, the things that you need to do in, in a day. Um, many of the young people that we see at Children's have already been there, done that, and tried many, many medications. So we're in a little bit of a different situation where often they're coming to us and saying, please, I don't want any more meds, I want these other things. So um, I, I would suggest that um, uh, if the family physician or if there isn't a pediatrician involved, if they haven't got enough information, that they could um, be uh, referring this young person perhaps to the complex pain service if that was necessary, or perhaps consulting with the physicians for the complex pain service if they just have a very specific question about medication. Um, so that, I, does that address this person's question? I will let you know if um, they respond. And outside of that, I don't have any other questions that people have submitted. So I think we will go ahead and um, end the presentation. Thank you very much, um, Sue and Aaron, both for your presentation. I think it was very informative and helpful. You're very welcome. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.